Um, so I'll move through this, you know, relatively quickly. I, I'm, I won't go into, I have a couple projects I'll go into more detail about, but I'm going to try to give examples of a lot of the things that Carrie read off. I want to thank Gary. I want to thank you all. Uh, Hunter, Stacy in the office, uh, real gratitude for getting to come and travel and give lectures again in person. I, I think that's really special. Um, so uh, I'll just, I'll move through this, and as I understand, there'll be some question time at the end if there's a project you'd like me to go more into or something like that, or an idea you'd like to reflect on more, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to do so. Um, I have about a two-hour lecture that I'll put in about 45 to 50 minutes. Um, Joseph Boys used to lecture until the last person left the room, if you know this artist, so um, I, I, I kind of like that model, but uh, I won't put you all through it. Um, a very ambiguous title. I want to describe this, not that, basket of vegetables with a red-headed doll of a leek laid across it. This is Cesla Milo. She won a 1980 uh, Nobel Prize for Poetry. Um, uh, uh, I'll look at, we'll look a little bit at where he sits kind of geographically um, in Lithuania, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, this region in the 1920s and 30s when we start talking about memorials and monuments and how we recognize spaces. I work a lot now basically in public narratives um, and materializing and spatializing stories and that falls into monuments, markers, or memorials. Markers, I'll show you some examples of nuclear markers and things like that. Um, I also really am founded on this idea of how do we learn how to learn. So a lot of these projects are based on kind of academy models um, um, and what that means, uh, mostly founded on people like Paolo Freire, who uh, wrote a book called, you know, We Make the Road by Walking with Miles Horton or Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So I'll be moving through that stuff a little bit. Just very quickly, you know, the title, you know, there's so many ways we could break it down. That's a zither, if you're not sure. Uh, the zither is really interesting because it merges the neck and the body, so it's not two independent instruments like a guitar. How do our practices, so the whole thing is a kind of resonating chamber. How do our practice, if we're taking multiple disciplines, how do we kind of create one form in which resonate all the skills in those disciplines? You know, the red-headed dolls. I was trying to imagine, like, what does that, what would that really look like? The dolls and theater, maybe. Uh, the, you know, children reproducing the behavior of their families and parent models in terms of playing with these figures in that kind of, uh, um, in, in, that, in that manner of reflecting and kind of translating their environments leeks and gardening and kind of the idea of a basket, like a, maybe a department's a basket, maybe a discipline's a basket. Um, but really, the, it, it comes down to the difference between this or that. Uh, how, do you, how do you make decisions in a critical way? And that's where that, the criticality of the discourse comes in. Um, how do I choose between working with this partner or that partner? How do I choose between uh, collaborating here or there? How do I pick between red and blue when working on a project? So, you know, as a student, how do you define your own language? of how you navigate those decisions as you choose projects and make decisions interior to projects. Um, I'm, I'm based now in St. Louis. I moved there um, in 2017 uh, to be in the Landscape Architecture Department, so I'm an assistant professor there on a tenure track uh, cycle. Um, and I came there, and I, this is a park near where I live, Tower Grove Park, with the large Christopher Columbus statue. He's the second most statued person in the America. Monument Lab is a great institute. I'll show a little project at the end that I'm working with, um, with them now on. Um, they did a big national audit of monuments recently, and uh, he's, he's the second figure, and we forget sort of the kind of, we, we turn these convenient histories and we forget the inconvenience of these histories. How do we represent histories of slavery? How do we represent the histories of, of, of women? Um, and this is where I'll end today's lecture. Um, we have Cahokia Mounds, and then we have nuclear landfills. So this is the Westlake Landfill on the right. I'll be showing a little bit of a project with uh, a group called Just Moms um, um, that represents uh, uh, this community. Um, this is a lot of waste left over from the Manhattan Project in World War II, so there's a lot of sort of heroic uh, uh, ideas attached to this, and there's also a lot of stigma. Monsanto, St. Louis, Malincrot, St. Louis, Black Lives Matter, St. Louis. So it's a very interesting place, kind of, the history of where I found myself suddenly living a few years ago and having to also define myself as a landscape architect and take all these interests and say, well, how do I expand the definition of this discipline? Um, so, you know, I said I'd be in the description. I'll mention a little bit about Darwin and Uxkull and things like this. This comes from that, that classic philosophy education. 
Um, if, you, if you've read Origin of the Species, Darwin tells a little bit of a story. I mean, that's a diagram from his journey on the Beagle where he's not looking at the things, he's looking at the relationships between things. And he tells this little story of the ant and the aphid. Uh, the ant uh, takes its follicle and it tickles the belly of the aphid and the aphid releases a drop of nectar and then the ant drinks that. And he described it as that kind of symbiotic relationship. Now there are etymologists described as kind of hostage situation. Um, the ants kind of grow, they, they hold uh, aphids hostage and then constantly feed off of them as a food source. Um, so there's some debate about sort of uh, whether or not this is a, a productive symbiotic relationship or not these days. Um, but what I'm also really interested in is that he then didn't just observe what happened, he tried to reproduce that experiment. So he pulls off uh, his own hair and tries to tickle the aphid belly with his own hair. So a small thing touching a small thing, kind of reproducing a behavior and it doesn't work. But it's that kind of taking the observation, understanding how something works, and then trying to kind of manipulate it and, chain, uh, and, and reproduce it um, that I'm, I'm really interested in. And this all goes into the theories of learning and pedagogy, or hoitagogy, is what it gets called today, um, uh, that we can, we can talk about as the, as the lecture goes on. Um, perception. So if the first is about kind of observation of details, and the second is about perception, you know, how do things work? You know, you sort of have the optical illusion. If you remove that corner uh, in the left side, you understand how the illusion works. If you, if you see the whole thing, you get that. Uh, you, you don't. So how, where do you find the moment around which, um, um, uh, it, not, not what you're seeing, kind of the reality necessarily, but how do you see? How do we perceive the world? Um, although there is that, you know, what do we see and what, how does what we see reinforce our kind of uh, assumptions uh, about what, uh, nature is or landscape is. So this is Millennium Park and you know you see on the top you see this kind of gorgeous uh, space and it's done a lot for the city downtown Chicago but underneath of it is all this uh, geofoam, this uh, structural foam. Um, so you know there's no connection between actually what the thing is made out of and how it holds you up and what you're standing on. So if you don't have that knowledge what does that do in terms of reinforcing stereotypes or basing kind of an understanding or a knowledge based on what something appears like rather than what it actually is, hold, how it's held together. Never mind that this is kind of, you know, restructured oil. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just show a little clip from this. If you haven't seen this movie, it, it, it also gets this point, you know, how do the, what are the systems around which, um, that is, that is uh, uh, what is really taking place under the surface of what we're seeing. This is a John Carpenter movie. If you haven't seen this, it's, it's fantastic. I, I, I strongly recommended it, uh, recommend it. Um, he's got these glasses uh, that come from another planet and they allow him to see kind of what's underneath the signs that, that he's looking at. Um, and he finds out half the people that he's living with are around in LA are robots. And, um, so the movie proceeds along this, and, and one of the projects I'll show at the end is about signs, a sign gardens, a project uh, that I'm working on um, through the Grio Museum of Black History uh, with, with mostly a group of black women and renaming streets <laughs> and street signs. So he, he, you know, the movie proceeds until he understands that all of the city is a kind of horizon of messages and what's underneath of these messages. What are you actually uh, um, sponsoring, reinforcing um, um, that informs the things that we see? And, you know, we could easily go into things like uh, Sao Paulo with signs, taking down all the signs uh, in 2006 for a kind of the Clean City Act. Um, so, you know, how, how, what's this relationship with text and words and cities and messages? We know this from learning from Las Vegas. So this idea of signs and messaging, um, uh, what is under the thing that we're, we're looking at? Um, perception, so perception plays a large role in this. If you look at this comes from developmental psychology. If you had to pick a sign, uh, if one of these, if, um, one of these is, uh, matches the sound kiki and one of these matches the sound Bobo. What would, you, what would you say the one on the left is? Bobo or Kiki? Bobo. Bobo. And so 99% of people, regardless of age or uh, ethnicity, where, uh, where you come from, will, will identify that sound with that image. So, you know, how do we link together, uh, not just a kind of interdiscipline, but that kind of inter polyphonic, intersensory environment too into our projects and understand how that works. I, um, 
Uh, if we need eyes on the street, we need ears on the street too. And this is a, uh, a project I'm working on now I'll tell you about later. I'm trying to kind of give a, a philosophic underpinnings of all the things you'll look at. So um, you, could, you could kind of match some of the projects I'll show you through some of these uh, uh, precepts in a way. Um, um, how, how do we get to where we want to go? These are from Jacob von Oxkill. He's in the kind of Darwinian tradition, early 20th century. He wrote a book called The Foray of a Foray into the World of Humans and Animals. It's almost close to that. It's very close to that. Um, but he would talk about things like darter fish and jackdaws. So the darter, the, the experiment was is that you'd have this wall and you would uh, it would start uh, perpendicular and against uh, the bottom line. And the fish would learn sort of where the entrance is and where the exit is, or the jackdaw flying around the building um, to, to get back to where it is. He would then open up that little door by sliding the panel. And the fish was no longer paying attention to its environment. They, the, the, dog, the, the birds weren't paying attention to their environment anymore. They fell into a kind of uh, uh, habitual routine of where things are. And so they were no longer uh, um, mapping and understanding the changes that were happening in their, in their environment. So it, you know, not to get caught in that, um, uh, that, that, whether we're talking about education and learning or, or within a project, that kind of formula. Um, um, and so I, I kind of moved through these ideas. Georges Perec wrote a book called Species of Spaces, which I, I strongly, strongly recommend. You know, observed for some concern for systems. You know, he says, we, already, we look at the street. We, um, uh, we're already projecting what we think is there ahead of time. You know, how do we, how do we uh, um, kind of subvert our own inclination to fall into these patterns of um, uh, knowing where things are? Uh, or Sherlock Holmes, I just kind of love this. He says, you have two choices. There's a good detective and a bad detective. The, do you make the crime fit the facts or the facts fit the crime? And so, you know, it's these kinds of anecdotes that start to really inform, to me, that knowing where to choose between this and that, how to make decisions within a, within a practice. Um, I, kind of, I kind of have a whole uh, uh, library of these little anecdotes to, that I kind of go to as step, uh, touchstones when I'm making decisions. Um, how do you translate these things into performances or into learning exercises? So, um, you know, I take these uh, driftwood uh, maps um, that are found in Inuit, um, along Inuit coastlines where, you know, you're not identifying where you are based on your vision. You're, you're, you're identifying where you are based on the sense of tactility and hearing. And so the driftwood is carved like the coastline. If the coastline changes, you can change your map by carving into the wood differently. And at night, these are floating behind uh, uh, the, the crafts or the canoes. And, um, and you sort of run your fingers down these uh, contours to identify uh, where you are in relationship to what you're hearing. There's songbirds that occupy each of these little coves, and they've evolved a little bit different song. And so you match that listening with that sense of touch to identify where you are. And then I, so I take that and I'll have students build these kinds of maps of spaces where we're working out of materials like uh, foam core or you know, garbage, basically. And then using these devices within crits and spaces so that we can also start to get into the kind of what, what it means to do social engagement with, or um, uh, you know, kind of alterations to a design process. Um, then post-it notes and kind of a big piece of paper when you're working with communities. So this is uh, the director of the art, undergraduate art at WashU, Tim Portlook, and he's wearing these, they're called lazy readers. If you want to make a good $10 investment, go to Amazon, buy, well, don't go to Amazon, but um, buy lazy readers. They basically project so that you can see things 90 degrees uh, looking down. It's two mirrors. It's an old experiment from the 19th century that has made it into a product so that you can lay on your back and read a book while it's on your chest. So, um, so I, you know, how do, we, how do we reuse these things to create experiences um, of place, um, to create kind of bonds with people? How do, how, do we, how do we take these things that we're inspired by and that we think about and translate those into processes? Um, and that's, to me, what social engagement is. Um, or at least one of the things. Uh, learning and pedagogy, like I said, hoitagogy is very important to me. Um, how do we learn how to learn? And I'm trying to situate this within uh, this, I, this uh, uh, category of action research. It's a kind of relatively new branch of research that is really uh, um, opening up to uh, social engagement processes, art, curation, um, uh, different ways of working. Um, that's a conulated cow. Uh, where you can actually study how uh, uh, cows digest 
uh, uh, their food um, while it's living, so you reach your arm in there. I, I haven't yet gotten to work with someone on this uh, as a project, but someday I'd like to. Um, um, so I got to run this school for five years, or I got to co-direct a school for five years called the Institute for Spatial Experiments. Um, it, the students received art degrees from the University of Art in Berlin. Uh, this was started by Olaf Eliasson. He's the, uh, the picture on the, on, the le on the right. He did the weather project at the Tate Turbine Hall, among others. But really where the sculpture is is, is, a, is an environment. It's an atmosphere. It's not something you stare at and you walk around as an object. It's rather a, a relational set of conditions that when they come together, uh, create something that can be experienced, but how it's experienced changes by how long you're there uh, or how other people are exper experiencing around you. And this comes from, or it gets kind of rolled into this uh, term called relational aesthetics. This is a uh, sort of important book in the, in the art uh, uh, context, uh, fine art, uh, art history context, coming out of a curator at the Palace of Tokyo in Paris. Um, this was a school, this is just one example um, you know, we, we did this project-based learning. In other words, we, you know, we made things. We were, almost each student almost had their own curriculum. We were not kind of, we didn't start with what you needed to know. We kind of designed each semester or year, depending on how the student, uh, that, that uh, students were changing and what they were interested in learning. We didn't call them students, just like in the Bauhaus, we called them participants, or, you know, we didn't call them journeymen or journeywomen. But um, we basically received a large grant from the German government or for the Berlin Senate, and um, which was quite remarkable because we suddenly didn't have to ask for money every time we wanted to do it. I mean, this would be a whole lecture on its own, the sort of administrative experiments that happened in this, and then the content that was co-produced. Um, this is part of a festival called The World Is Not Fair, World's Fair. A group called Raumlabor in Berlin was curating this. They just won the Golden Lion this year at the Venice Architecture Biennale. A really just incredible group of kind of tactical urbanists, artists, um, that, that fall under the, the architecture billing. And they had eight or nine teams that moved inside the Tempelhof, this air, airfield. And we built this, so we ran a, um, a design build. We built this infrastructure that could be moved in and we called it a parliament. We, had, we accepted a resident that year that was in the Berlin Senate as a, a politician. And uh, we had these, and the mayor of Berlin is in that circle. And we could use this to have uh, discussions and public events, but we could also move um, the conversations out of there and into the field, as you see on the top right. The middle picture is by a really incredible group called Cooking Sections. If you don't know this a young group called Cooking Sections, it's two architects. Uh, they, that one of them went through Goldsmiths. They just won a Turner Prize in England. This is the largest kind of art prize you can win. Um, and, and they do things like go research salmon and then they have dinners. Um, you know, really kind of extraordinary practice taking architecture and taking uh, social engagement in another level, and they kind of started within this month where we had this infield, and we would work cross ages, and some of the students were working in theater, and so they started working with uh, retirement homes and putting, and uh, you know, what, what do you do? Oh, you ride a motorcycle. Let's ride a motorcycle through the pavilion, or you know, starting uh, not who wins the race first, but whoever, who, who can be the slowest, who can get there last without getting off the bike. So you kind of reverse the rules a little bit and just play with that. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip through this a little bit. Walking was a really big part. This would probably be, if we could call it a course, it was a course. This constant sort of relationship with um, uh, making, designing these perception experiments um, um, and doing this with students, exploring the city, using public spaces as a classroom. And this is really where I learned how to do things that I love now, like I call these play shops. And this is all the freshman uh, architects at WashU. Um, you know, we each designed six. They wanted to, I mean, we each sort of have groups of sticks and they design components, they put those components together, we make one big pavilion. Through this they also, I teach a little rhino workshop, so they start to understand this relationship of constraints and um, um, a kind of basic parametrics almost. Um, and you know, my background, I spent a year digging wells. This is really where I learned how to do, I think, where I started to learn how to do kind of community engagement. Um, we would go into communities and we would build this with, build wells with communities in Ghana. Um, and we would have the sense of propriety. So we wouldn't build things for people, we would build things with people. And in that sense, there's ownership, um, there's pride, and, and you can leave knowing that the things that you're doing are, are taken care of. And I combine this with the three summers I spent on an archaeology dig, doing surveying work, and 
in the, in the necropolis or in these architectural uh, uh, digs. This is run out of Oxford and, uh, Oxford and NYU, and it's a site in southern Turkey. Um, but, you know, basically going back and well, how are you representing what you find? How are you disregarding the layers of history that are, are not significant to the researchers? Um, uh, you know, how do you dig? Where do you dig? Um, and then how do you translate that through, through drawings? Um, so a longer project I've been working on for, for a while now. I mean, this book should have been finished a long time ago. Um, the, grant, uh, the Grand Foundation of the Arts supported uh, this research, and I just keep rewriting it to kind of fit the discipline that I'm teaching in. I've taught in art and architecture and landscape departments and industrial design departments in the last 12, 13 years, 14 years. So, you know, what I'm doing now is, is just kind of rewriting it the last time so it's not an art book or a poetry book. But um, essentially, it, it's the questions of, you know, how does rope work? And the reason why I'm very interested in this is I, I, can, I can talk to rope makers. I can, uh, I can look at the relationship between the agricultural plots and where the sisal or hemp or jute is grown. But I'm also really interested in the engineering of it. So, you know, that ropes are, are twisted in two directions. And if you all will do this with me, if you feel like it, we could do a, there's a right twist. So if you kind of turn a steering wheel the right way, and then, it, so this would be, uh, this would be the um, S twist if you look on the bottom. And then the other is a, if you turn it left, uh, you get a Z twist. And you, you twist each of the yarns, uh, one yarn, uh, uh, a right twist, one, one, one yarn, uh, a left twist, and then you add a third yarn. What happens is that, that as the ropes are being twisted, um, they hold on to the energy that you're inputting into that system. And when they try to come apart, they come apart into each other. So they hold each other together which is you know, a pretty incredible metaphor. Thomas Jefferson uses this as a metaphor for democracy. Three parties that are working against each other or, or sort of twisting in opposite directions that in kind of moving in opposite directions hold themselves together or two party system. You know, there, there are, so we could talk about um, that as a model for democracy. We could talk about it as a model for interdisciplinarity. Um, we could talk about, and I try to develop a philosophy around this. These are old rope walks. Um, the men wearing kind of fibers, uh, skirts that have been uh, made out of fibers that have been redded and combed and uh, gone through this process of getting to be reconstituted as yarns and then strands and then rope. Um, the idea that you hook that to the, to the end of something you're working on and then you move away, for, away from it to build it up. So I really like the kind of counterintuitive nature of that. In order to make something, you're actually kind of stepping away from it uh, um, as, as you build it. Um, and I look at things like this is a quartery that Bernard Lassus, um, a French landscape architect, redesigned the building that's 330 meters long to make a 300 meter rope. You know, we can't quite fathom the, the logic of that anymore, but it's quite extraordinary. But it's also the relationship of the agriculture, uh, the fields, the farms, the labor, the dredging of the river, um, that kind of military uh, uh, industry uh, that, that uh, rope falls under now. It's a, it's a strategic material. It's been uh, in the United States a kind of a strategic material since the 1940s. Um, so, you know, really understanding at a level of, you know, the, the tendency of a, if you look on the very far right, there's a single fiber. It has a tendency to twist in one, that either right or left, depending on the lattice of its cells when it was growing. Um, and then the sort of larger ropes that are being made from uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 uh, individual ropes. So it's kind of an algorithmic process. It's one of the oldest uh, tools that we have um, uh, uh, in the kind of uh, anthropological sense. Um, so whether or not, so what I do is I excessively twist the ropes. I connect these things to public spaces. Um, I connect a rope to a stick and I turn it and I turn it and I turn it and then eventually it kind of collects all that energy. And then from that you can reach into the system and start to manipulate uh, sort of what kind of topology of knots or, or snarls are going to grow into that rope and people come in and they want to help and, and do things. Uh, w when we were at school in Berlin, we moved the school to Ethiopia for a semester and lived together and worked together and I um, uh, found these uh, rope makers there that would, these two young women, uh, Dinkanesh and, and Meheret, would, would collect these bindings coming in from boxes into the Mercato. They would sell them to older men. The men would take um, anywhere between 12 and 14 days to twist individual bindings into a, into a yarn and then twist the three yarns together into a rope. And so then how do we then, you know, that upcycling, how do we start to, and then I use those uh, for installations and lectures and things like this.
Um, another ki this is also kind of how I think that, you know, how I work in terms of that, you know, working into the system. So how do you understand like the, uh, the systems around us, uh, what, what are the conditions, what, what conditions, the options that we have to kind of misquote a, uh, a quote by, by Wayne Kunstenbaum in good German. <laughs> um, so, you know, in, Berlin, in, in, in Germany or in Berlin in particular, we start, my, my partner and I, who uh, we, we just purchased a playground. This was the, the leap, uh, which I'll just show really quickly. But, um, you know, we started interviewing hunters. Not very many people have guns in Germany. Um, there, is, there, there, are, there were 76 full-time hunters, seven, uh, 17 part-time hunters year-round. They were hunting foxes and uh, uh, wild boars and uh, raccoons through the city. So then they would sell the wild boars to meat markets, uh, and we would sort of intervene at that point and buy a wild boar, and then we would rent these grill walkers, and we would cook the sausages. This is a, well, this one's a Mangalisa swine on the right, which is a weird kind of very hairy sheep that has again a contradiction. In order to preserve it as a species, it's going extinct. You have to kill it to save it. So it has to become a meat product or it's gonna go extinct. At least this is the thought behind New Yorker had, I mean, New York Times had a great article about this particular species, if you're interested, Mengelisa swine. The idea of how, do, how we're preserving the, or countering this, this process of extinction. Uh, is this such a good technique or not? Um, um, but we would rent these grill walkers and then kind of crash exhibitions or um, do these kinds of walks through cities and suddenly uh, the people are coming to us almost migrating across the city to, uh, to, to get the thing that was migrating across the city, eating the, uh, out of the garbage cans and things like that. Um, this is the, so I, 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 like I said, I'm not going to go into this too much. This is a the, on, the, on the left is an adventure playground design uh, that my partner and I did a couple years ago for an exhibition in uh, the Architecture League in Chicago. Um, we've been researching adventure playground models for quite a while. This is, these are risk-heavy environments. This is where children basically are citizens, are treated as citizens. They, they make the things that they play on. They make those together. Uh, they learn how to ne negotiate decisions, and, and, you, and you create uh, risk situations. Um, this is very hard to do in the United States, and we kept kind of negotiating grants and uh, finding uh, partners, often art institutes. And um, in recently, I mean, as of two weeks ago, we, we purchased an old playground. That's a picture of it on the right. And we're going to start to prototype kind of models, work with uh, um, uh, different groups to, to, to grow this over time, but basically to live a proof of concept because um, we were just having a hard time. Uh, getting people to sort of see past the liability and the problem uh, that it brought, that, it, that the, this kind of, it, it's not like a nature-based playground. These are wonderful, but it's very different. And this term, adventure playground, gets kind of uh, uh, misused a lot. Um, another project I do that, that I've been working on for the past, I mean, this is going on for 12 years, is um, I call them urban scores. It's informed by a kind of... Uh, these situationist uh, maps, you see the one on the right, on the left there, the naked city. Um, the idea that, you know, how do we move through the city? How do we start to negotiate spaces? Um, how do we create encounters with people? And so I started taking poems that are from uh, the different countries that I would be traveling to and, you know, not being able to focus a lot of time often on my own projects when I was responsible for, you know, uh, uh, sort of choreographing a class while we're in these cities. I would be able to walk around and ask people, you know, what does this mean and where to go next? And so in this way, I could have three or 400 encounters. I would, people would start to first say, you know, what do you want from me? And the next thing you know, they're you know, uh, crying about a poem that they learned German through in the middle of a market. Um, um, and you're you know, drinking tea with them and you're uh, um, finding out stories. And basically take those, I take those ex experiences and uh, make these objects. That's a shoe cobbler there in the middle. Um, he sews these together and they can go into exhibitions. Um, or so they become, this is a 30 foot kind of uh, paper uh, uh, installation, let's say, or a map. Um, this was Ai Weiwei's uh, father's poem, Ai Qing. He was a very influential po uh, poet. Um, and I asked, I had asked Ai Weiwei, what, what, you know, I know your father's a poet. Could I, would you pick a poem that you think is relevant today? And he picked one called The Wall. And so I walked through Paris for a week in and out of the two Chinatowns on every business on both on, on the streets, um, going from Mandarin to, to uh, um, uh, French to English. I don't speak any of those languages except for English a little. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and then I, those can go into exhibitions and the poetry can go into journals. Uh, I really like trying to pierce the kind of barriers of these disciplines. So I, I've been publishing these for the past uh, 10 years in, in a pretty you know, respected journal. Some of these are m more experimental, but some like conjunctions of the Chicago Review are, are, are pretty heavy peer reviewed. I'll see that's a warning that um, I should get to my other stuff. Um, but the poetry, you know, it, it, to me, it's about precision. It's about narrowing down the words you use and deciding between this word and that word and really looking at the kind of meaning and the semantics. But I, I also stud got to study with a poet uh, named Ch uh, Charles Bernstein who started what was called language poetry at the University of Pennsylvania and really talking about the materiality of words, talking about the phonemes and the sounds, and I'll, I'll show very quickly an image or two of that. Um, this is a book I... I uh, co-edited with a couple of artists that were in the institute and uh, com took the, they took po uh, pigeons and they, in a, in a very friendly way, I mean, these were non-toxic dyes. Uh, the pigeons were spray painted and then released back into uh, public spaces. And then I gave each, in a kind of euphrastic way, I gave, uh, picked poets that each received a pigeon and they wrote a poem based on the, the artwork. And then we published this book a few years ago. Um, art historians could come in and talk about the relationship of, of humans and animals. And my students look at poetry. We analyze very, this is how I teach rhino or teach rendering or teach 3D printing. You know, they analyze poetry, they find rhythms, they find structures that are built on repetition. Uh, all the, design, uh, the environments we design as architects, as landscape architects, are also a repetition of elements. Um, what are those patterns there and how can you start to cultivate that landscape imagination, as, as James Corner calls it in his writing. Um, and so, you know, and at the same time, really just learn some programs and software. Uh, in this Etienne Jules Marais sense, they put reflective tape on their bodies and walk through parks and develop little sets of moves. It becomes a way of creating a path or analyzing a space. And this is also coming from Japanese gardens, this idea that where you focus, if, if you have a regular path, you don't have to focus anymore on your feet, you can look around. Uh, if you have an irregular uh, path, you're constantly having to redirect your attention on where you take the next step. And so this, these ideas of really focusing your attention uh, and, and, and as a, the perception as a, as a kind of tool to, to play with uh, really informs the work. And some of the students just make what I consider gorgeous renderings. Um, this is a translation of a, of a villanelle uh, by, by a, a landscape architecture student that recently graduated. Um, and I've been working in and out of these poetry groups. This is a poetry jazz group that I'm a part of in Addis Ababa and in Germany. And we just, we just released this book last, or during COVID last year. But um, so all the kind of press for this was canceled. But again, we're, we're talking about this with artists and designers and uh, people that work in words. And, and really the book is about kind of coming together and trying to find meaning between three different sets of, 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 of language. And I, I've been recently designing, this is the first kind of poem path I've, I've made where I work with foam core uh, and limestone. I mean, it's limestone because of the region and the, the lintel. The shape is formed by the dimension of a lintel that's on the house where this is. And basically, I can take the foam core and I can lay it out in one-to-one -one scale based upon a kind of rhythm of walking that I want to reproduce. So I can kind of sketch and write and walk at the same time. And as I'm doing that, I can then solidify a structure that informs then. So that on the left, uh, well, the, the path that you see is on the right, and then this gets translated into a series of soft and hard stresses, and then those soft and hard stresses get reiterated with articles and subjects, and now I'm having those, uh, um, uh, those uh, blocks chiseled so that there's a, there's the, the poem then emerges, but it's really a kind of poem machine, and the idea is that I could start to design these as more permanent installations or markers as well, try to really blur the idea between art and landscape. Um, I said a lot of the work I do is around, is around learning, and so, you know, I've been opening perceiving academies um, um, w whenever I get the chance. These are usually two-year projects. I work with mayors and municipalities, art institutes. Um, this is in Thessaloniki. Um, they wanted to sort of use these public spaces, an old abattoir, and this, this plaza that has these very nationalistic sculptures in them, and that used to be a wonderful uh, alley of trees, and so we were really trying to engage this space um, I'm working on this with Lynn P. Moeller, and we build these temporary pavilions. We carry these through town. The mayor, we're working with the mayor here. That's the, uh, the, the, the city hall behind us. 
Um, and we, in this kind of Oscar Schlemmer way, then we do these public performances where we're kind of dancing with these tubes on our arms and then we make these temporary installations. Again, this is kind of tactical urbanism, but you know, in this we can play with food, we can play with forging, we can collect water from local uh, water sources and make lake soup. This is a, I asked Alice Waters, you know, I, these are not people I have very big relationships with, but I just approached them with something a little bit odd and I said, well, this is from a Perec. He is imagining what, how much beef consomme it would take to turn Lake Geneva into a, into a, 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 a soup. And so she writes me a recipe and then we collect lake water and we make soup with chefs in the restaurants. And this becomes part of the exhibition as well or the kind of public event. Um, I work in Iceland with deans there to do the same. And I'm, you know, this is an instance where suddenly the dean of the art school in, under which the architecture and the planning and the, and the, urban, the, the design departments fall under. And we were partnering with the engineering department as well. So I had about 23 participants from eight or nine different departments. And we spent two weeks together making instruments, walking through the cities, conducting this dinner. It was in January. Um, we would do contact microphone experiments putting these into glaciers and things like that during these walks, during these hikes, and really, you know, get to know each other. And then everybody co-produces uh, a, a work at the end together. Um, this is in Chicago, same thing. These are the perceiving academies that I, I design. Uh, they, they usually go between uh, 30 and 50,000 euros, so a little bit more in dollars. But, um, um, you know, basically living the things that we always try to talk about, in, interdisciplinarity and, and uh, social engagement, pub uh, participation, things like that. Um, a dirt garden or a, a compost garden that we put on the sixth floor of the Sullivan building and people ate their words or, you know, we did made cake mandalas and this is David Hayes, if anybody knows David Hayes, it's, you, he's the chair of uh, landscape architecture at uh, uh, Urbana Champaign. He's in the wolf outfit. He's kind of, I asked him to make a lecture of a place that didn't exist in this kind of Borgesian way. Um, and we're playing, with, and at the same time, all these Kaladni plates, and we're playing with sound. I mean, the curators really didn't like this exhibition as much, because I constantly changed it and uh, would use it more as a kind of space to play in, uh, in that kind of Alan Capro sense. The one, I, I, again, I'm going to have to go through this really uh, quickly to get to the memorials and monuments. Uh, this is the last one. This is in Cyprus, the most recent Perceiving Academy. Um, Cyprus, this is the Mediterranean. Uh, this kind of bird-looking thing, and that's Cyprus there. It's about 70 kilometers from Jordan, and uh, um, um, so it has a very interesting history. Um, we're in Nicosia. Nicosia is a divided city. In 1974, uh, Turkish military moved in and within 24 hours displaced 180,000 people. Uh, the United Nations then put up a wall across the country as a peacekeeping force that's still there. It's kind of the longest divided a country uh, in the world right now. And so I was brought in to open an academy that had participants from both the north and the south side, and we did things together. Again, we used the city, but if you'll even notice in the map, I mean, every map you buy, the streets have no name on one side, the streets are named on the bottom. Um, you know, so, so how, how does this play out? And so I'm very inspired by Lawrence and, 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 and Halpern, uh, landscape architects and a, a West Coast choreographer, you know, really using dance, really using choreography and movement to map and to do social engagement or what they call take your time processes. And we did this as a sound map. So this is about a three kilometer sound map that we made together. This was the image used for the lecture series. And this is, uh, uh, I think, 11 people, each with about a 300 meter path. Um, the dash line is where the buffer zone is. And so we spent our time walking the loop. The only constraint was, you know, how do you, once you pass through uh, one gate, you have to pass to the other, and then you try to hug both sides as close as you can to the, to the, to the buffer zone. And so each did a note. I kind of took them through these exercises of attaching uh, their hearing or, their, or the sense of sight to four different infrastructural systems in the city. This could be the color of awnings or fire hydrants or planters to come up with a notation system for that. Uh, for that mapping, preserve the relationships of distance between those four systems, and then they take that notation system, each gets a sound, and then each of the sounds, then we worked with a sound engineer um, to basically produce uh, a sound poem. Not necessarily something you'd listen to, like music. You don't kind of go home and put this on. But, it's, but, the, but you're listening to the map, and you're listening to the different infrastructural systems that overlap in this loop. 
And then again, you're having to translate that into something else um, that, that helps you to sort of break the perception you already have of it ahead of time and, um, and, and create something different. In this, you know, we go to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we perform anti-acclimation rituals where you, uh, oh, these are good examples of sound poems from, from uh, uh, Augusto de Campo, a Brazilian sound poet. Um, we work with blind trainers. I almost always try to work with blind trainers where I go. And this is a school, a Missouri School of Blind, and, and, and all my students at Wash U get trained by blind trainers. But it's this, it's also this infrastructure. This is a um, wastewater treatment center. The large the, uh, uh, shape that you see is the old one um, that uh, was, was, was made in the 50s, could no longer uh, hold the capacity of uh, Nicosia and the surrounding region. The little one with orange is the new one, and basically the EU came in, and it was wastewater that brought the tables together talking for the first time. So it was infrastructure that brought the north and the south parts of the, of the island together and talking about literally where does all the shit go between us. Um, so I take students out there, and I can reference, this is a great book, the, the dean of Miami School of Architecture, uh, Rudolf Alcori, translated this. He talks about cities and the history of the sense through uh, the sense of smell, but these huge vats that we walk around, and we go there to try to say, well, when do you, these are the anti-acclimation protocol. When do, you, when do you stop smelling? When do you stop noticing the smell? Because your body acclimates to it. So it's not that when, how do you just notice something that's there? How do you notice when, when the thing that's there is, is, is gone? Um, a much harder thing to do. Um, it's a very kind of, I, I, I love teaching kind of Chinese ancient gardens because when you look at a rockery, you're supposed to see the water, even though the water is not there. You know, it's the, what Wallace Stevens, a poet, says, how do you know the difference between the nothing that is and the nothing that is not? So there's a nothing that is here, and that's the thing that we're trying to pay attention to, and I won't go into all the sort of wonderful examples of uh, wastewater treatment systems and history of the Cloco Maxima and um, the, the statues to goddesses of, of uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when we do that, we understand the cycle that when we use the restroom in Nicosia, it takes uh, 24 hours from the, when you flush the toilet to get from where you live to the wastewater treatment plant. It takes another 29 days for that water, the waste coming in to come out as water and be released into the fields as irrigation or uh, the woman in the top left, these kind of biosolid pellets that are used as fertilizer. And so the, again, this kind of contact, making contact with something that we can easily map and kind of intellectualize, but how do we taste it? How do we, how do we get it and an imprint into a, uh, a story where we ha have that kind of phenomena, phenomenal experience of it? And so we work with dough and uh, restaurants and things like this. Again, we sort of set up this public art project at the, at the, board, at the right in front of the gate on the, on the south side. Um, worked and then, and then we took groups around with us and performed this sound map as a, as a public kind of parade. Um, so you can see it. This is on the north side there. And you know, suddenly people are following us and heckling us and joining in. And, and at the end, we made a vinyl album. And uh, if you've never seen a, how vinyl albums are laid, it's really extraordinary. These kinds of where the moment where the where the uh, uh, the, the needle touches the, the material, and I do these same kind of experiments with my students. These are landscape students from uh, Washington University of St. Louis that were in New York, and we're mapping. And this was something I did with Ed Keller at the New School. We were mapping different blocks in Manhattan using these as sound scores. Um, I've been working also a lot in the sound and, and, and trying to, you know, how do we hear where we are rather than just see where we are. Um, this is a, uh, funded by a grant, um, call, uh, by a group called Divided Cities. It's a Mellon Foundation sponsored grant where I built a tool shed at the Contemporary Art Museum. And the tool shed housed an installation of two speakers on one side, two on the other. And then I made these uh, kind of 19th century hearing aids. Um, these hearing device, ear glasses is what they were called. And uh, you walk around and we're using parabolic microphones and each person is asked to, you know, we do these walks for an hour and uh, these walk shops and uh, each person has to find one sound that they uh, hear along the way and then they have to think of a concept, uh, a concept that matches that sound. Uh, the idea of concept generation is one of the tenets of philosophy. So Deleuze would say, uh, Gilles Deleuze would say, you know, philosophy is the development of concepts. I think that's half right. But, um, but the idea of these public concepts, public philosophies, how do we hear where we are? How do we listen to where we are? Um, and then making sound portraits of the city. And this is informed by three stories. And I just I very quickly do this. I just love them, though. Pythagoras was known to teach behind a curtain. So you separated what you saw from what you heard. How do you separate? How do we attach ourselves to the senses that starts to 
to, to uh, predispose our feelings uh, about the message, what we're hearing, or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who put a curtain between, uh, uh, she, she, there in, the, in the 80s, uh, conductors, uh, it was thought women couldn't conduct as well because they're women. And so she said, well, let's just see if that's true. And she put a curtain between the, the symphony and the, and the, and the, and the, and the uh, people that were judging the gender of who was uh, conducting the symphony based on what they were listening to. And she found, of course, that's total BS, the idea that some gender is better predisposed to being a better conductor than others. But that's, you know, Yoko and John Lennon who are hiding, you know, give interviews you know, for beds, but they give interviews under sheets. They also try to frustrate that attachment to the image, to the words they're saying. Um, and this is a very nice grant. I mean, you know, I put together a team, the curator, uh, Vassan uh, al Qudari on the left there. And then uh, what's, this is a neurophysiologist, uh, Casey O'Callaghan in the blue shirt. And then John, um, um, uh, uh, oh no, did I forget? I can't have forgotten. Um, John Bao, sorry, it, it sort of an incredibly, he just was elected uh, the, the uh, president of the National Linguistic Association, so he kind of had to step out of this a little bit, but he would do research on the sound of the words we used and the associations and how you can uh, um, understand class and education um, and privilege through accent. Uh, Spike Lee has used some of his work uh, for his movies, um, uh, sort of an extraordinary uh, writer. And so, you know, the sociolinguistics would take, go into malls and say, you know, what floor are the shirts on, please? And they would record the answer. So you have to say shirts, and there's an R in there, and floor, and there's an R in there. And, and so how do we start to understand cities and the kind of demographics through, through uh, uh, the sound of our speech? This is an old publication from the uh, turn of the cent uh, 20th century, uh, Detlef Mertens, uh, uh, art hist uh, architecture historian that passed a few years ago, wrote this book on G, kind of the elemental parts of form finding, and I, I'm interested in that, but I'm also interested in this, the language itself, of course, or um, the, the Gutianum, which was supposed to be, this is Frank Lloyd Wright thought this was the, one of the most brilliant buildings in Europe, where it's basically, uh, it was, was, was uh, uh, designed as a kind of cavity, like a, a mouth, um, and then, you know, asking people, well, how, where do you pronounce your letters? Where do you pronounce? So let's map that. Um, yeah, so that was 20 minutes left about 10 minutes ago. Um, so the, 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 yeah, I've been working a lot more in monuments and memorials. I mean, this is the topology of landscape architecture that I really love. And, and this is where I think that we could move away from the idea of a memorial as an object that you look up at and that stands over you. Um, Aldo Rossi uh, had this great way he categorized uh, monuments, the propelling monuments versus pathological. Propelling have the capacity to change and, and pathological do not. And so here's a memorial for balm trees in uh, um, Japan that survived uh, um, the atomic, atomic uh, bombs that were dropped. And these city, the, you can apply as an institution for seeds and you can cultivate the seeds around the world. And so, you know, there's this, there's, there, there is that uh, um, propelling memorial in a, in a, in a way. Um, a propelling memorial might be, you know, the AIDS quilts that are distributed and collect stories over and over and then take the stories and spatialize um, um, uh, areas in the city. Um, Nelson Berwoltz are doing propelling memorials. I think this is in, uh, in Houston where they fell every 20 years, they fell hundred, they, they will cut down thousands of trees uh, uh, to, re, to reenact uh, the camps that were, um, um, in this space, uh, um, um, I think this is a Civil War uh, park. It's called Memorial Park. They didn't know why it was Memorial Park. You can listen to a great lecture uh, by, by them uh, on uh, if you go, there's a GSD. They have a very nice lecture. Um, this, is a, this is a pathological mo monument, right? The monument that doesn't change, that tells a story, that re-issues uh, trauma to a community. So what's being pictured here are also... Uh, kind of conquering and slavery that are depicted in these reliefs. And so if you're a not a Roman citizen, you're walking around, you see this, you see yourself in a position like a lot of our memorials that uh, um, would amplify the, the indigenous population as servants to people like Christopher Columbus. And my students also use these, you know, these ways of mapping view sheds and sound sheds to create memorials. This is one uh, where um, she's memorializing a barber shop in, uh, in, in St. Louis. And the idea is there's a competition every month 
to, to take the best haircut that's given and then you cut that into the field. Um, and so you have this kind of living uh, relationship with this performativity of something that could generate interest across the city. Um, I'm going to move through this. this Daniel Sporary, nails on the glasses, just beautiful. Um, so how do we re, you know, use these spaces? How do we think of uh, um, the city and all the surfaces as also context to uh, 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 do work like this? I was going back now to uh, Cheslo Miloš's uh, where he grew up in this, um, in this relationship of war and how cities undergo these transformations. And how do you represent this is before and this is after? Um, this is in Berlin. Styrofoam is used for all these walls to simulate masonry. Um, you know, how do you rebuild in, into the image of your past? Um, this is in St. Louis, the, 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 Bush, the former Bush Stadium. You know, they're memorializing the stadium, but 100 years before this, there were two slave pins that were there, one that was just selling children. Um, incredible conditions. I'm in the Reparative Justice Coalition in St. Louis, and you know, so we go down and try to engage these spaces with vigils or, or um, uh, interview uh, surviving members of these families. But when you go to them, these are the convenient histories. Here's a convenient history of the former baseball field. What about the con inconvenient history of the site of, of where we're looking at? Or you know, when you're working with memorials, not to do, let's say, what Sam Durand, a very good artist, does. I mean, he does very interesting work, but then this was a project that he uh, did in Documenta in Kassel in Germany, and it was sort of praised. Um, this is the same project at the Walker Art Museum, and it was closed down. And the reason it was closed down is because he didn't work with any of the co indigenous communities that he was taking the stories from. And so it was, it was a very insensitive uh, appropriation of someone else's story. And this is the story that he was, he was taking the hanging gallows, but he wasn't engaging the history, the living history. And this is the propelling monument where groups of indigenous tribes ride on horses hundreds of miles in the middle of winter to go back to the site of this hanging, where Lincoln hanged 38 people at one time, the largest mass hanging in the United States. And so, in, and this is a fantastic movie. If you haven't seen this on YouTube, I would, I would, I would highly recommend it. And so, you know, to, to reproduce the image of something, the way it looks again, the kind of appearance of things, um, without missing the opportunity to actually engage with the uh, communities whose stories it is, is very, very important. So, you know, in my mind, sort of social engagement is like sewing a sweater, knitting a sweater while the wool is on the sheep. You know, you're, you're alive, the thing is in motion, and I've tried to get knitters to do this. They just very hard. Um, but, you know, how do you materialize the idea? And so I'm trying to come up with this idea of relief landscapes. This is the largest uh, carved relief in the world. It's uh, in Stone Mountain in Georgia. It's three Confederate uh, uh, generals. Um, in the summers, uh, 100 drones come off and do a light show, and the these horses ride into the park. It's, the trauma this causes is incredible. So the chair of sociology in the blue shirt, David Cunningham, came with us. When I took students, you know, we make our first stops um, within the historic context and within the groups working within to, 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 to talk about Stone Mountain now and, and, and the trauma this can cause a community. When, how can we offer relief through landscape architecture and through memorials rather than exacerbate the kind of pain? Um, so whether or not we're working, this is the Just Moms I mentioned that has the nuclear waste. This is with Gunther Volk. He came in for a couple of days. I brought him into uh, St. Louis, and we would do these very slow walks around uh, the, the landfill um, just to experience what's there and then find one thing in the environment and bring it back to us and uh, talk about it, map it, uh, build something together. Or my students were each partnered with a community member from that group, interviewed that. The, the, those community members is a kind of light ethnography and then composed movie trailers about their story that then we had our midterm at the church where their community meetings are held and then the finals they came to Wash U and um, we presented our work of their, of their stories really. Um, and uh, these are nuclear markers. I mean, they have to stand for 10,000 years is the idea. Um, so, you know, you're trying to cr create a message that's immersive, that's experiential, that's not based in language, the prototypical language. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, after 10,000 years, you understand 5% of that language typically is what, is what uh, um, the, the going idea now. So in other words, you wouldn't understand anything that was inscribed um, in, in words. So how can you create that in experiences? And we, here I borrowed a space the university wasn't using, and we created a three-day exhibition 
The Shuying here has a big ear. You walk into the ear. Her video is at the end of the ear uh, near the brain. There's another one on the side of her, which is a brain. So the, the students are also sort of getting involved in this work in the real story, in the installations, in the curation. They're running this exhibition. And then inside of this, we have our critiques. I'm just going to end with these two projects then that I'm working on now. Um, this is... Uh, the Monument Lab, and if you, if you don't know them, I, I would really look them up. It's a really great group out of Philadelphia. They just won a $4 million uh, Mellon grant, and they gave a million of it away to 10 teams across the country. And I'm on a team that won one of them. Um, the idea, um, I'm working with the Griot Museum of Black History, and I had been working with them with students for a while. This is a representation class I taught where people picked objects from their collection. Aretha Franklin had just died, so we were asking, what is a legend? Um, they learned the difficulty of lighting and working with objects, but they also learn the difficulty of the software and how do you, you know, pictures and software programs around visual images that aren't made for people of color or, or black uh, people, African Americans. So, you know, what it means to take a picture of someone and how that starts to um, also get compromised by some of the tools we use. Um, and I basically, the, the idea is, is that we're going to make street signs and street sign gardens that um, represent uh, honor black women. So this is the team. Um, and it's a, the four of us are kind of the main team. Alana that you see up there, Lois, who started the Griot Museum 27 years ago. Um, uh, Dee Nichols, who's at the bottom. And Aaron Williams, who has a, a group uh, in, in a neighborhood called The Ville in St. Louis. And essentially, we'll get together and take some of the, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on some of the areas that have streets named after slaveholders and anti-abolitionists and will basically design something else that honors uh, either these, these national figures or mothers, uh, you know, basically people that live in the community that can see themselves reflected in the, in the spaces that, that, that they live on don't just reinscribe these uh, names that, that have uh, uh, um, caused a, a lot of damage. Uh, to, to a community and so you know is it a street sign or could you take this and make something really much bigger in terms of a kind of a public artwork and again we're using these kind of tactical urbanism I think you're familiar with this because I've seen some of the I know some of the professors here uh, uh, teach in this um, they're great guides uh, online for this um, that's a project that just started um, it was a hundred thousand dollar grant will be finished uh, we'll be going next summer all social engagement will be building an archives uh, oral and, and video that will go back into the Griot Museum. Um, you know, come to, come to St. Louis. <laughs> um, you could help. Um, the other thing I'm working on with a developer, and this is through Sinland, Cinema Landscape, is I'm taking, um, I'm working again with the Griot and an African-American uh, Af uh, uh, professor in African studies named Jeff Ward. And we, we revived this, uh, basically a big developer downtown that has developed a, he uh, represents a company that owns a large street downtown. And, uh, the National Blues Museum and things like this. And they said, well, what would you do with a public artwork? And so I said, well, I wouldn't build a big robot hamburger like the guy that they were going to hire. I said, I would really try to build this as a propelling memorial. And so I'm trying to kind of use this language a little bit that, and, that we circulate academically. And we, with, uh, with Lois from the Griot Museum and with Jeff, we came on this history around education. We're very interested in education. Uh, John Barry Meacham in 19, 18, 1847, uh, opened, uh, he, he moved a school onto a, on, onto a steamboat to get out of the jurisdiction uh, where you couldn't be educated if you were black in uh, St. Louis. Um, so he moved onto the Mississippi River. He moved the school onto the steamboat. He also started the oldest African, uh, the, the Baptist church in the city. And then for 10 years, he ran a school here where you would row to your classroom and come back. And so, you know, how do we, how do we take that and kind of take that history and make it felt? And the first idea was, let's get a big crane and hang a steamboat from it. And everyone liked it. And then I really started researching how much cranes cost and how hard it would be to do this actually. And so, you know, we sort of take the idea of these heavy histories that are hanging over us. And this is actually a, a kind of rip off of a Jeff Koons who hung a, uh, the front engine of a, of a train uh, for an exhibition in LA. Um, so we've kind of been moving to that. And we, we're gonna do a, a large street mural now of the Mississippi River, uh, working with um, a professor in environmental studies to actually try to map the neck of the river that's by St. Louis and then build a, um, a basically a set of kind of mobile infrastructures that might just even be the word freedom, uh, freedom school. The word freedom is so contentious today. I mean, it's claimed by all sides. I don't even know if it's a productive concept anymore to cling to. But 
Um, these ideas of maybe we make rainbow machines and they make mist and you can move these things around to different areas on the street and you can create classrooms or when the Blues Museum has outdoor summer concerts, these could create uh, um, um, a kind of uh, environment around a hot summer uh, day. And this is being kind of done in this space that I'm, I'm, I'm now occupying. Uh, I have a lease for a dollar a month um, for a nice space in downtown that, was a, that wasn't being used. Um, and so where we can kind of engage this as a headquarters. So that'll be happening next summer too. Um, and I just thought I would end with two things. Um, you know, the idea, so that idea of hoeing, uh, the hoe is a, one of the oldest uh, uh, instruments or tools uh, that we have uh, in terms of humankind. Um, and I had translated a poem that was called This is Hoeing in Chicago Review, and I thought, well, what if we really made hoes? So when I came back and started teaching in the US, um, uh, and I did this the first time at, at Cornell. Um, so this was an this, this is a group from WashU, but I did this with a group of architects, and everyone had to learn how to weld. Everyone researched the hose. Everyone made their tools. Then we went out and planted garlic gardens um, in mediums of streets. We've done this in downtown Chicago. We did this last week in St. Louis. But the idea that one, you learn a trade, right? You learn something like what can you really do with welding when you direct heat? And we can also talk about things like Marxism. So that's the uh, title, uh, the picture on the very small, the top there is of a novel by Emile Zola called, called the, um, I think it's called The Good Earth. Um, and essentially, but that I, if you see on the top there, you have a laborer leaning on a short-handled hoe. And this is a, it was a Marxist critique, the idea that the tools we use retool us. And a short-handled hoe makes you lean over. So one person in a field uh, that, that can basically maintain control over hundreds because when you then stand up, you stand out. And so the idea that you could suddenly use the uh, perception as a way to coordinate uh, 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 you know, massive labor uh, work and all that would be then controlled through the length of the hoe handle. And so we can talk about these stories. Or Ferdinand Braudel, who is from the Annals School of History, he, he mapped what was called the hoe belt in the diagram at the bottom. And you know how civilizations and settlements developed around this relationship to agriculture and the tools we use. So all those stories can be told from a historic point of view, a kind of philosophic point of view. We learn how to make the you know we learn how to make the tools. We go plant something. I, I'm always you know I'm not a big planter. My partner is, but I'm always amazed that we can go through a full <laughs> graduate landscape program and not have planted a seed ever. Um, so the idea that we make we make the thing that we talk about is really important to me. And students kind of map where they think the best location sometimes in the cities would be for these. And so it's also a way to kind of build build learning uh, into uh, project, uh, projects that you do together. Um, I thought I would just end, I mean, not the video Conchi quote <laughs> necessarily, but the Raymond Williams quote, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than uh, despair convincing. Uh, to, to me, this is kind of drives uh, a lot of the ways I make decisions between this and that. Um, I, I had done a lot of ex installations and uh, for some biennales and things like that. Uh, before and during the school in Berlin that I was a part of. And you know, about halfway through it, I just, I just wanted to make things that have more meaning and were significant to the communities I work with and that make stories, tell stories, uh, take those narratives and spatialize them. So you know, it's that kind of thing that drives a lot of the, my own practice and teaching. I went a little over. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>